see y'all in here today. Well, it's good to have everybody with us today, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing what I've studied this week and last night. Uh, as I put on Facebook, I want to talk about regeneration versus generation. And I think it, I think I know you're going to enjoy what I found. I did a lot of digging and looking at words and different verses and what Jesus said. Uh, I was talking to Donna this morning. Uh, I, I really have enjoyed meditating and thinking about when I discovered a few weeks ago that the actual word for uh, uh, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank right now. Oh, Christ, excuse me. For Christ is actually Creole and it means contact and since we've been talking about how as we study the bible we everything that we look at today we've got to understand that it's talking about an awareness uh, coming up higher is awareness just uh, everything in the old testament all of it's about awareness and so i was thinking this morning years ago i taught a series on the feast of the lord and there was a place in there where it said fortunate happy and well off are those who hear the sounds of the feast. So now I understand that, that to be fortunate, well off, and happier of those who stay in contact with Father, because Father is our source. Father is our food, if you would. You know, we feast on our oneness with our Father, and so it is important to stay in contact. Uh, one of our church members, uh, our couple, Ann and Carl Smith in Chickasha. Uh, all across Oklahoma, there's an electric company called OEC, and they're putting fiber optics cable everywhere. And I noticed several months ago that there, there's a pole out there in front of their house that has the fiber optics cable hanging from it. And they don't have good uh, uh, internet speed at all, and very good, very hardly any good telephone speed because they live way out in the country. So I keep telling them that it's there. But the problem is that it's not it's not connected to the source yet. Well, they just found out that it's connected to the source, and so they're going to run a cable to their house, which is a fiber optics, and they're going to have the highest speed internet that you can get through through cable. And now they're going to be able to make contact with the world, <laughs> and they're going to be able to uh, gain knowledge. They're going to be able to watch us live when they can't come. And basically, it's going to open the world up to them. So I, I like that as a picture to me because I believe when we stay in contact with our Father, it opens up volumes of understanding. It opens up everything to us. And so uh, in the old outlook, which is the, you know, I, I've told you before that there's no such word as testament in the Bible at all. But it says in the old outlook or the, or the, the expectation of life is the way it was. The word generation represents a period of time. It represents an age, a, rev uh, a revolution of time. But in a new outlook of life, which we call the New Testament or whatever, the word generation represents an offspring or to procreate. It represents kin. It represents race, nation, country, and diversity. And so that's the emphasis that I want to put on uh, today in this lesson in generation as it represents race, it represents kins, it re represents generation nations, or generation, generation does. And it represents uh, generation and it represents diversity. So uh, regeneration versus generation, we need to understand what that really means because too many people are fighting for their generation. We saw that in Israel. Uh, Israel thought that they were better than other people. They thought because God chose them as a chosen generation, that meant they were better than everybody else. Hence, we hear the word Gentile all the time, and all the word Gentile really means is those that's other than Jews. But they exalted themselves as better than. And so, as of the year we live in, 2020, and for several years, we live in a time that's not like, uh, unlike many generations that have walked on this earth for thousands of years, where again, racial differences have hit a critical mass and I looked up the word critical mass I just heard that but I looked it up the phrase and it says the minimum amount of fissile material needed to maintain a nuclear chain reaction and so this critical mass issue around the world we're seeing 
is the con as a consequences of the fight for rights, the fights to be different, the fights to be the fight to be better than, or the fight to be as good as other people, thinking that we're not. And so I say critical mass has been created by people who want to greedily control this world. They want to control the countries of the world. They want to control the people of the world. So the way they do that is they create division. And one of the greatest ways to create division is racism. And it's, but it takes place everywhere. It takes, case, takes place in religion. There's division in religion. I, you know, some people say, well, I'm a Baptist and well, I'm assembly God or I'm Pentecostal holiness or I'm Lutheran or, or the list can go on and on and on. But what it is, it creates fear and fear comes from ignorance and then it creates blindness. And it, it's, it's from those people who are supplying the material, if you would, to create this chain reaction that's spreading destruction all throughout our world. And I've been talking to my friend Butch Hodge for s several weeks, and we're, we're always saying, what's it going to take? You know, what's it going to take? We know what it is, but what is it going to take to stop all this from going on? Because it's causing a lot of, uh, hi, Teresa, it's causing a lot of problems in the world. It's causing death, you know, uh, it's causing people that would not normally kill people or beat people. It's causing them to do that. So our younger generation, they're being pulled apart. Uh, to the point that they're even being divided with their families and separated from their families. There is an enemy that's causing it. And the enemy is, is a uh, enmity that the Bible talks about. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But it's, it's in people who are in power, but they're functioning out of a, a lower plane consciousness. And they're seeking nothing but power or control over the nations when they're supposed to be serving us and righteous ways and so we teach about oneness and the fact that every person ever born or will be born is a son of god or a daughter of god one big family and that's what we are the entire world is one big family but because we've been taught this separateness and we we spend more time thinking about our race or our nation or our creed or our religious title or whatever it is, then we stay separate. So however, races, nations, countries, and diversity of which people fight for have really brought this division, not necessarily just one person or one group, but it's produced the people that we've allowed to be in charge that are not righteously ruling over the nations, if you would. And what it does, it, produ it produces a me, myself, and I mentality as separate from you. And that's a stronghold in mankind's awareness today. So what is the answer? Well, <clears throat> as I listened and I meditated last night in my office uh, for a while, what to write on, I heard the word regeneration. And that's how I usually know what trail I'm going to go down. And I kind of thought that I would see that all throughout the Bible, but it's only mentioned two times in the Bible, the word regeneration. It comes from the Greek word, and I can't even begin to pronounce it. It's spelled P-A-L-I-G-G-E-N-E-S-I-A. -E -E and it means, I, I love what it means when I found it, it means a rebirth in, in awareness. This world is desperate for a rebirth in awareness. One of the root words is Palin. I, I'm sure Sarah Palin would like that. But it means the idea of oscillatory uh, re, 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 repetition, this uh, repetition. In other words, the same, the sameness of mind, if you would, that we, we would never leave that state of mind that we were born in. It continues on and on and on. And then another root word for that means to uh, th this, this word pale, P-A-L-E, means to vibrate, or we could say raise your vibration and there's a lot of talk about our vibration our energy level uh, k has taught on how jesus raised his vibration raised his awareness not necessarily his awareness but his vibration and his energy that brought healing to people and then another one that i really like is actually it's genesis g-e-n-e-s-i-s -E -E and it means nativity or nature to literally we are to come back to our awareness of our true nativity 
And when was our nativity? It was before the foundation of the world. It was in the mind of God. And so I've written several times in this book and others about how Jesus was never left his birth state. He never lost contact, C-H-R-I-O. He never lost contact with Papa. And so I am one who believes Father never intended us to live with these distinctions that we live in today. Father never intended us to live with a mindset, you're this race, I'm that race or whatever. We're just different colors of skin. We came from parts of the world where the environment caused people to be darker or, or whatever, but we're all the same. And if we could see with our, our, our uh, holy breath eyes, our spirit eyes, because we're used to hearing the word spirit, if we could see that when we look at each other, we would see each other as one. And I, somebody that's one with me, I would never intentionally hurt them. You know, I have hurt people before because I've been carnally mindful because of stresses in my body, maybe made me blow up or something like that. But, but those that I know I'm in contact with, those that I know that I'm one with, I love, I love very much and I care for them. But the truth is we should love the whole world. We should love everyone we see because we are one with them. So Father's intention was, was and still is for all of us to live together as one and having love for one another. So therefore, uh, those who would say that's not possible, I say I put, my, I put my faith and my confidence in Father's faith and what Father said. Father said that we will enter into rest. We will enter into the very rest of God. And that means rest at one, with one another too. Not just rest with God, but rest with one another. Because I was talking to Butch about this this morning. If I hate somebody else, then I hate myself. If I hate somebody for being black or somebody for being white or somebody for being Indian or somebody for a, a different religion or whatever, then I hate myself. And we've many times we've said we, we hate people. You know, there are people that came to America and caused great destruction in our country. And there are people say, I hate them. Well, if you hate them, you hate yourself because you're one with them. So I put my faith in what Father imaged of mankind and projected out into visibility. And that is man, male and female. And he created man, male and female. Literally, it says he created himself in Genesis. He created himself, male and female, to reproduce him. And Father is nothing but love. So if there's anything other than love coming out of us, then it's not Father. So there are only two verses, as I mentioned in the Bible, where the English word regeneration is used, and that's Matthew 19, 28 and Titus 3, 5. In Matthew 19, Peter, uh, Peter said to Jesus, it was really funny, this statement. He said, look, we've forsaken all and we followed you. What shall we have there for? Peter still lived kind of child-minded for a long time. You know, they were seeking to be uh, in the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven or whatever. They were expecting to sit on the right hand of Jesus. They were expecting to be, if you would, kings themselves. And Jesus said, I say to you that you which have followed me in the regeneration. And then he makes some other statements that really have to do with the disciples' awareness being raised. And I'm not going to explain all that right now. But I want you to really major on this. I say to you that you which have followed me in the regeneration. To me, that would say you followed me in what I've taught you. You followed me in the understanding that I've tried to bring you to. to for you to get back to that original birth state. To get back to your nativity. To get back to your awareness of your oneness with, one was with God. Oneness with God. And then Titus wrote, speaking of Jesus, not by any works of righteousness we have done, basically anything, but by the baptism of regeneration, our restoration of our Holy Spirit being breathed out and through us. So we see these, these two words that are very, very important, and yet we don't see them a lot in the Bible, but I think there's other words that possibly mean this. But a dilemma for most people is a belief in mankind that his life and his happiness depends wholly on something that comes without. That's a great dilemma today. Because when you think that your happiness and your source 
depends wholly on that which is without and you're always going to without for that you're always going to fail because it's not your source getting more money is not going to produce happiness whatsoever don and i have been watching a series that we've enjoyed called alone and these people are taken to different parts of the world and there are 10 of them that are chosen and they're supposed to be experts in survival uh, survivalist expert survivalist and the winner the one who's the last one standing if you would will get a half a million dollars the majority of them are doing it to get that money they're thinking if they get that money they're going to have a better life they're going to be able to do everything on without that they want but after being alone for quite a while the majority of them realize it's not about the money because the money is not going to bring them happiness and eventually they realize that it's not worth them dying for but yet many people have gone to without they've looked to the world they look to their jobs they look to all kinds of stuff for happiness and they're dying because they're not living the, the, the in contact with God they're not living out of their true source so living with that false belief causes also a needing for restitution and we're seeing that today all these race problems today all of a sudden people want restitution for what happened to their, their generation 70 80 90 100 150 years ago they want restitution for that because they still think that what can come from without is going to bring them happiness and joy and it will not it'll always you will always want more and more and more because it never satisfies it's just like if somebody murdered a child or murdered a husband or a wife and you want restitution you want them to be executed you want them to die many many people have been asked do you feel better after that happened and they say no because restitution never makes you happy so living with this false belief traduces the fact that all people have within them the power of holy spirit the power of breath that establishes every one of us in our eternal truth supply it, it, it establishes in the fact of who we are who god images into existence from all eternity so I like where it says there the baptism of regeneration in Titus. That represents two steps of returning back to perfect contact. And that's what we need. We need to return back to 24 hour a day, seven day a week, every second in contact with our Father. It doesn't mean that we just walk around talking to God all the time and and you know we don't work we we don't have to go off and be monks and sit under a tree and just meditate all day long if that's what you want to do that's fine but we don't have to do that to stay in contact with god we just have to consciously realize that father is our source and always be sensitive to the moving and the voice of the father within i can be working and father can talk to me i can be in my garden father can talk to me i can be talking to donna and all of a sudden something comes to my mind or to my awareness and it's father speaking to me and i share that with donna jesus did that all the time he talked in parables he used physical pictures almost all of his conversation was literally the source was god in his thoughts and he was trying to explain that to the people so baptism regeneration represents this uh, in contact with the mind of god i call it, i put down here papa awareness so first of all one is denial one of the steps is denial and the other is affirmation and both of these are important the denial is the dropping of our old worn out awareness and laying hold of the truthful awareness that makes us free we have to deny that in our life you know uh, when a person's going on a diet and they want to lose weight there are things they have to deny you know with me it's ice cream I hear a thought that says, boy, ice cream would make me feel good today, but I'm trying to get my body in shape. I'm trying to get my sugar level down or whatever. So literally a wise person will deny that. And I would have to say, no, it's not good for me. Not that it's a law, but it's not good for me. So there is a denying that we have to do that because until we deny that which hinders, we cannot take hold of the truthful awareness that makes us free. And the apostle Paul said this, he said it in a different way. But he said that you put off concerning the former conversations of the worn out way of speaking as a carnally mindful person who is corrupt, corrupted by carnal desires. That's Ephesians 4.22. In Colossians 3.8-9, he used the same phrase, put off. So that, that's the same thing. If you're putting something off, 
you're denying it, right? You're denying its right to you. You're denying its, uh, it's it been, been able to interpenetrate your awareness and take hold of you. And so in each instance, he was talking about putting out a old, putting off an old worn out carnal mindset, living the law is one of them living by the law. And so we put off this carnally mindful speech. We put off the carnally mindful acts and the deeds. And then Paul wrote in several more places to the churches. He said, put on the armor of light. Why is it an armor? Because it protects you. Light is revelation. Light is the spirit of God or the holy, uh, holy breath of God. Put that on in your awareness. And when you put that on, it protects you from any carnally mindful things that can come against you. Then he said, put on uh, incorruption, put on immortality. In other words, stop living with a liable to die mentality. Our whole earth lives today with a liable to die mentality. All they've got to do out there is produce a little bit of fear and we get scared to death that we're not going to make it. If you watch any television at all, everything is like uh, liable to die. If you're not taking this drug, if you're not taking that drug, you're liable to die. If you're not buying gold and silver, you're liable to die. You're liable to run out of money. If you're not storing up food, you know, we're, we don't even know what our source is if we're afraid, if we allow that fear to come into our life. Then he said, put on your contact with Father. In other words, it says put on Christ. So it means put on contact, put that on in your understanding. You have to do it. You have to consciously say, I am going to stay in contact with my father, pay attention to your thoughts, pay attention to what you say, and be constantly casting down the vain imaginations that hinder you from doing that. And then he also said, put on your eternals, eternal newness of being. Now the King James said, put on a new man, but we didn't need a new man. We already were new. We just didn't know it. So he said, put on your eternal newness of being. So what is baptism? I spoke about that in an earlier chapter of this writing here. But baptism is much like taking a bath after working in the dust and the dirt all day. When I go out in my yard, and if I were to do it all at once, which I don't anymore, but it could easily take me four hours to mow my front and backyard. My backyard only takes me about 15 minutes or less. But it would easily take that long and then I edge it and then I pull weeds sometimes and then I trim bushes like I did day before yesterday. Well, when I come in the house, my skin is all dark and dusty and I don't see that beautiful skin that I have. And so what I do is I go in and I wash myself or I baptize myself in the water. I immerse myself in water and it cleanses me and takes all that dustiness of life off of me. And to me, that's a real simple picture of that being baptized in the living word. You wash yourself or you clean yourself. And, and that's, a, that's a sense of regeneration. I restore myself back to my original state. Does that make sense? I restore myself. I get all that grime off of me. I get off what's itching me and irritating me. You know, I, I grew... Uh, uh, tomatoes and cucumbers. Well, the cucumber plants have a lot of stuff on it. And when you harvest the cucumbers, you start itching and it starts irritating you. Yeah. And so I have a choice. I can come in the house and sit and complain. I can go and ask somebody to rebuke that off from me or bind me, bind that off from me or tell me what I need to do to stop itching. Or I can just go take a bath. And if I just take a bath, it cleanses. And the, the, the sad thing is, is most people take a bath about once a week, spiritually speaking. And some people once a month, spiritually speaking, they only do it when they step into a church. And the truth is most of them aren't taking a bath. They're getting more dirt put on them. And they don't know why they're just itching and they're not comfortable and they've got problems in their life. So this baptism of regeneration is very important to us. It's the power of the living word that's poured into our conscious awareness and what's poured into our conscious awareness flows into our subconsciousness to where this sense mindedness is erased. And the truth is the truth is inside of us already. I don't need to really put on the truth because I have the mind of God. I have to put on my awareness of the truth. That's what needs to take place. Yourself. We remind ourselves. It's another regeneration if you would. And so there, our holy breath, 
our God mind, lights its fire at the very center of our being, and it raises our soul experience, if you would, because we're a soul, right? We're a living soul. And so it raises our soul experience or our perfection of life to where we can literally experience life and life more abundantly. We can be in the, I don't want to use the word the midst because I don't want to say involved in it, but all kinds of stuff can be going around us, but yet it doesn't bother us. And people say, how can that happen? By staying in contact with God. Jesus is greatest example of that was he was with his disciples and there was a raging storm, probably almost like a hurricane, and Jesus was asleep on a pillar in the bottom of the boat. Wasn't afraid at all. Why? Because he was in contact with his father. And the disciples were terrified. We can be at peace in the midst of what's right. going on. Yep. And I'll never forget one time I was flying to Houston to my home office that I used to work for down there. Somebody keeps calling you, baby. You need to mute that. Uh, and the the uh, turbulence was really bad. The, the, the plane was literally, it sounded like something was hitting the plane. And a, the lady next to me grabbed my hand. It, we, we hadn't talked or anything. She just grabbed my hand immediately and she was terrified. And I just spoke and I said, ma'am, I don't know why I said I'm a pastor. I shouldn't have, but I did. I said, I'm a pastor and God's not done with me. So don't worry, this plane is not going down. And it was so funny because she kind of got on, uh, got up, raised around and looked behind everybody. And she said, we're okay. He's a pastor and God's not done with him. <laughs> it just brought her a great, you don't remember that? Yeah. It brought her great faith. Mm -hmm. but, but Jesus knew that he was okay. Jesus knew that everyone around him would be okay because he put his faith in the faith of the Father. And God sent Jesus to, to, to do a work and God was not done with Jesus yet. And, and he lived literally out of full contact with God. So he knew no weapon formed against anyone could prosper or could hurt him. And so in the regeneration, all the carnal forces, a, a hurricane or what's going on in the world today, racial riots, we, we can li literally not be affected by that. And we all are, Ben but we shouldn't be. We all, we read on Facebook, all the bad stuff. We watch the news and, you know, I, I was thinking the other day, uh, I think it was Sunday morning, I was watching some of the news and it was all nice stuff. It was, it was nothing about what was going on. And I thought, this is really cool. These group of people in Fox was reporting wonderful things and spring and things that were going on. And then they went to the next place and all of, all of a sudden you saw the pictures of the writing and see, we, are, we allow those images to come into ourselves, and they produce fear. And what they do is they bring us to the lower plane that we don't live in. But they bring us to that awareness. So again, we have to fight the good fight of confidence, the good fight of faith. And that fight is to stay in the faith of God, stay in the faith that Jesus revealed to us. All these things that are going on are because people are in the lower plane and they need to be transfigured by their holy breath that's within inside of them, their thoughts, their awareness, and then their subconsciousness. Because Paul talked about this, I don't think I'll be able to get into it today, but he talked about how there was there was sin in his members, and what he was talking about. There's this, there's this in my subconsciousness. There's still this desire for the law. There's still this pulling for the law, and so in our subconscious, there are thoughts and awareness that need to be baptized by regeneration, regeneration. And that's when I say, I am Roy Richmond, one who is in perfect contact with my father. That's when they said Jesus the Christ, they were saying Jesus, the one that stays in con is perfect contact with his father. So once we place all of our confidence in the contact, the confidence or our faith of our father toward us, then we realize that that's a great rock of assurance to us. You know, if there's something that's a rock, I mean, it's, I always talk about my friend Butch Hodge and he's tall and he's, he's larger than me and stronger than me. And if somebody came against me, Butch is always saying, I've got your back. Well, if Butch was there, I wouldn't be afraid of anything. If some guy came up and said, I'm going to beat you up, 
and Butch is right there, I would not be worried at all. Today, I'd be kind of worried because I don't have a lot of strength in this body to defend myself. But there's a rock that we can, that we can stand on, and Jesus was revealing that rock. And that, that rock is the revelation of who our Father is and who we are. Uh, Jesus was talking to Peter, and he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Who do men say that I am? And Peter said that, I say that you're the one that stays in contact with God. And Jesus said, that was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by the Spirit. And then he said, upon this rock, that I am in contact with the Father, and what I say and teach is truth, I will build all people up, and the, gauge of, uh, the gates of religiosity will not hinder it. Now, I always, I, when I first discovered this, I thought it was pretty cool. The English word for rock that Jesus is referring to here when he said upon this rock is Petra, and it means a massive rock. This massive, it's talking about God. It's talking about the revelation of God. It's talking about the, the massive rock of revelation that Jesus was there to reveal. And then Peter's name is Petra, and his name means a piece of the rock. So he was part of the rock. He was there, and he was going to preach a message that would bring the very first day 3,000 people to join the community of believers because he preached the eternal love of God. And so to me, that's pretty awesome. So uh, can you see how a rebirth, if you would, in our awareness, I don't need to be born again. I'm here already. I don't need to go back into my mother's womb. I don't need God to recreate me. I don't need God to make me new. I need Father to give me a newness of revelation, or I mean of understanding. My, my understanding needs to be moved away from that which is carnal to that which is spirit or breath. So this needs to take place in our awareness. Regeneration forms a newness in our consciousness, of which will release newness of life in our body. A regeneration in our awareness will stop racism and religiousism and politicalism and the list can go on and on because there's all kinds of isms you know people uh, have lots of money and they look down on people that don't there's and then there's people that don't have a lot of money and they look down on people that do it, it it's a carnal way of living and that's what's causing everything that's going on today and so we see that in the revelation in tw chapter 21 when john wrote a new heaven and a new earth and of course religion teaches that all the the, the earth is going to be destroyed and the heaven is going to be a wonderful place and we're all going to go there and everything's going to be fine but that's not what it's talking about again you must remember everything's about awareness so when you read the book of revelation you need to search for awareness or you need somebody that can teach you those truths so what did John see? He, or he, he, this is what he said. He saw a new awareness resulting in man's body experiencing its eternal newness of life. When, when, when our awareness becomes in total contact with God and total, the total truth of who we are, our body will experience it. Paul talked about how there's a salvation or a rescuing and literally it's a salvation from before time. God created our bodies perfect. He imaged our God's perfect. And so it says to wit, the redemption of the body. And the word to wit is an Elizabethan word that means to know. And so that salvation that we need to understand today that our body was born redeemed and it still is redeemed. We just don't know it. We have a traducer in our subconscious, which is the lie, or it's the law that was taught to us all of our life. As I, I told to Donna, I told Donna today, I said, you know, we go to college to learn, we, get, we went to school to learn, uh, grade school, high school, college to learn, we take other courses to learn. Why is it when we went to religiosity, we didn't learn anything but what we needed to do to please God? And that's sad because that's what religion does. It doesn't teach you truth. It teaches you what you need to do. And doing to be is a dead, filthy rag. It's a religious work that produces no life whatsoever. And so John saw this. And he, for the, he, he said for this antique and wore out carnal mindset of the power of death that had over man's body is no more. And then it says there is no more sea. And that the sea is confusion. That's what it represents. There's no more confusion. So... When, 
when out of Israel, out of Israel, Jesus showed up. Through Israel, Jesus showed up as a deliverer to set Israel free and all people free and to cause people to be able to enter back into the cool of the day living with Father, which is Ruach, which is spirit. <clears throat> the ministry <clears throat> and teaching Jesus began in Israel has been going on for over 2,000 years. It's amazing, you know, that that what one man taught and there's other people that have taught things too that have continued on and on but it got mixed with religiosity the words that jesus said got twisted around and mistranslated but the truth is still going on because you can't stop the truth i remember that song glory glory hallelujah his truth is marching on it is marching on there's always the people in every age that's after the truth and so Jesus began that, but I believe it has not reached its completion in mankind. But I believe it is. I believe it will. He said, Father, he told the disciples, I have to leave. And he had to because they wanted to worship Jesus like he was a, a king. They wanted Jesus to rule the world. They wanted Jesus to, to kick out the Romans. And they wanted to be part of his rule and everything. And he knew that. They wanted him to be their doctor and the, their financer and their their uh, uh, provider for food and everything. That's all they wanted from him. But he said, I have to go because you, you, you can't, right now you're not able to comprehend what I'm trying to teach you. But he said, I'm gonna pray the Father and the Father is gonna send you many, many more comforter teachers who will take and teach and explain everything that I sought to teach and explain to you and you wasn't able to bear it. And father's kingdom of righteousness peace and perfection and joy over the entire earth is the re the end result of what jesus wanted them to know and yet today people are still looking for the kingdom of god to come they're still looking for the what they think to be the kingdom of heaven in other words one of these days we're going to go somewhere to the kingdom of heaven and we're going to have peace and joy but yet jesus said the kingdom of god is where it's within it's already within us so this great work of regeneration literally brings all things to remembrance. It reminds us who we are. As Kay said about when Nicodemus came and asked Jesus, how can a man be born again? Born again, the Aramaic says a man must remember who he is. So this whole thing that we're going through is a regeneration of our awareness or of our memory. And so from the 1800s to present, there have been many people or many groups or many set apart teachers and writers and explainers here in America who felt this would take place in their generation. And I understand this. I have a lot of old books, uh, ancient books, you know, some from way back in 14, 1500s. I have some from the 1800s by a name, uh, the latter part 1800s by a man named Charles Price. And he had tremendous understanding of this. He had tremendous understanding of penal substitution, which was better than, you know, what a lot of people taught somewhat, but he mixed everything with a lot of, but he thought it was for his generation. And almost every book that I had that I've read before, they thought it was for their generation. Well, the truth is it was for their generation, but it didn't show up in their gener generation because people continue to resist, to fight, to traduce, and to mix it with their religious doctrines. But I believe these people felt this way because they were part of the foundation for what we're presently experiencing. There has to be a foundation built. And I believe it has been built. I believe there's a people that's been kept apart. There's been a people that's kept separate. There's been a people that religion has rejected and they still are today that has built a foundation to the point that here we are in 2020 and our awareness is greater than i've ever seen before what we're teaching and explaining this group of people in the earth today far supersedes what was taught 20 30 40 years ago by the by any kind of crowd whatsoever but there is a crowd there is a group of people that's teaching truth and so what we're doing is all of these awarenesses are beginning to be merged together and we're accepting that are being accepted by the masses instead of just a few people but they're not sitting in mainstream religiosity 
They're not sitting in the churches that are on every street corner because religion's still trying to hold on to what they've always had. It's a slower process. It's a slow process, it's but it's a, getting it's faster. It's a slower process. I think it is going into the mainstream churches. It's just slower. Well, it's it is slower because the resistance has to be broken down. So we're discovering writings of old that reveal what Jesus taught. I, I have discovered some old books and ancient books and ancient writers that really revealed ex what Jesus taught and from the original transcripts, from the original understanding, but more than anything, from listening to the very Spirit of God. You know, I've talked to you about the scenes that were part of the, the uh, Israel's religious sect. You had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. We don't hear much about the Essenes. They're not mentioned much in the Bible, but they were a people that believed that that, that there was a spiritual understanding to everything that Moses wrote and the prophets said. And they went off into the, to the desert. And the desert always represents a place of been alone. When it said Jesus went to the desert, he didn't necessarily go to the desert, you know, uh, always. He just got away from the crowd. He, and he stayed away from religiosity. He didn't want his awareness to be infected by what they were teaching. And so we're discovering these writings. And we're also discovering that Science, the science behind the universe and a man reveals father in every way. Kay Fairchild's been, I don't know how many lessons she's at right now, quite a few, probably up in the 60s or 70s or more, but she's teaching on the mind-brain connection. And, you know, I know that scares some people, but it shouldn't. If you would just listen, it makes sense. When she talks about the body and the spine and the pineal gland and all the other parts, you can, you can literally see that's a spiritual understanding of how God's life literally flows through our entire being. That's in my lifetime. I've never heard anything like that taught in church and religion. People have always told us to stay away from science, to, to stay away from symbols. And my uncle always said, said, son, you know, the symbology and all that stuff, that's, that's, that's dangerous. You need to stay away from that. That was religion speaking through him. So there's no, uh, we, we discover the science behind the universe and we discover that God's involved in everything. We discover that God's involved in me, that God is me and God is my source and it is supernatural. So there is no more me or you when we understand this. There is no more color or race or creed or divisions or diversity. We're all one. And we have discovered that the Apostle Paul was correct when he said there's ne neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. For you are all one in awareness and union when you, you are one, but you experience it when you stay in contact with the God mind as, as Jesus did. Can you imagine what it would be like if we, we, all of our information came from our staying in contact with God? If we didn't receive information from the television and from the news media and from carnal sources but it was all spiritual information what it would be like it would be glorious right so we're living in that time of regeneration a rebirth in awareness back to one's original state of being rising or raising our vibration and returning to our genesis which was our nativity our godlike nature that's what regeneration means there is a royal priesthood of teachers in the earth today. They are explainers uh, all over the world. And I believe there are people who have risen out of every religion who are declaring truth that was intended in the beginning of creeds and beliefs and convictions and faith. They're, they're rising up out of all those to declare the truth of who we are. They're living as the true light of the world. We are the true light of the world. I wrote a book on that that I've got the true light of the world. But even though, even if we are the true light of the world, not all people are shining that light. Many people are shining the light of carnality or the understanding of carnality. But I believe, I believe the light is increasing and increasing and increasing in us individually to where it'll go to all the dark places in our conscious awareness and our subconsciousness and it lightens it up until all living expressions of father reveal the glory that's within inside of them the only thing that needs to happen is that which is dark needs to be removed that's it you know my friend carl smith i've mentioned it already but he had uh, afib arterial fibrillation and they did open heart surgery so they were able to 
cure that by cutting away the disease. And when they cut the disease away, within about two or three weeks, Carl had no more symptoms of arterial fibrillation. And I believe it can happen very quickly if we can correct a person's identity, correct a person's consciousness, including ours, very, very quickly, we will live as the glory of God that we are in the earth today and will bring great help to the earth. So our thoughts, uh, beliefs, and confidence, are, which is the word for faith, are, are forced, they're forced, if you would, they're Im embodied or, Im or emboldened from the central I am of our being. God said, I am that I am. Or we can say, I exist of our being. Those who function as the tree, uh, a tree uh, of life, if you would, are the, are the true light of the world, are endowed with spiritual intelligence and endowed with spiritual power. Now we have it, but we're not necessarily endowed to the point that it functions. But when we become the true light of the world and we teach the truth, that's because we are endowed or we are gifted or we anointed or anointed with spiritual intelligence power because they're in contact with a supreme power, which is God. Not because I'm better than anybody, not because I've done anything to make myself that way. It's because the Spirit of God drew me up higher, or drew you up higher, whoever, to stay in contact with the Father. And I love being in contact. I love being able to be quiet and just hear the voice of God. And when I'm not quiet, I hear the voice of God. When I sleep, I hear the voice of God. I no longer worry about what I need to teach. I just wait and I hear the voice of Father, speak a word, speak a subject or whatever, and then it flows. So we all have the ability to make contact and awareness but not all are, real, are ready yet. That's the problem. Not all are, are, are uh, fed up with what they, the way they've been living. They haven't, Most, denied their... they haven't denied all that stuff. And they all still think that Jesus is coming back to do something. They believe that it's God's responsibility. And after all, we're just humans. Who are we? We can't do anything. And I've heard people say that many times to me. So what was the, the question... Thing they had Deny. deny. And then you said there was another thing. Oh, baby, you're going to make me go all the way back again. <laughs> you had to deny and then you had to embrace the truth. Once we have all that. Okay, I'm just going to take the time to answer your question. Well, I was just wondering, deny was one and then was baptism the other? Baptism regeneration. It's, it's embracing the truth. I'll look it up and give you the exact thing here in a little bit. So, so we all have this ability, like I said, and not everybody's comfortable with it yet because they're still comfortable religion with their religious belief system. They're still happy with that. They've not come to the end of it. You can just watch Facebook and see how people are saying the rapture is going to happen any minute. I have friends from past times that are, are declaring a rapture and it's the end of the world. Uh, and, but they, and also they haven't come to the end of the winds of doctrine, which is that. They're just nothing but dead works. All my life, I'm 70 years of age, all my life up until 1996, I was taught a rapture. And we were always looking for a rapture. And it has caused a lot of problems in people's lives because if you're waiting for your magic Jesus to come back and save you and take you to heaven, then you're willing to accept living in the lowland. And that's where people have been. And they think they can't do anything. And these dead works that we've been taught, the Bible says they're filthy rags. Isaiah wrote, all our own works of righteousness are as filthy rags and all we do fades as a leaf and our iniquities like the, like the wind have taken us away. And then it says, and there is none that stays in contact with your nature that wakes up our awareness to stay in contact with you. Then he said, we have concealed your image in us. It has consumed us because of our stubbornness and our contrariness to stay in contact with you. But, he said, but now, but now, O oh Lord, you are our source, Papa. We are the clay, you are the potter, and we are all of the work of your hands. He realized that finally. 
That's what we've got to realize. We have, we've got to stop this racism. We've got to stop this political agenda and the things that are going on in the world and realize we are all the work of God's hands. God is the one that made us. God is the one that created us. God is the one that made this entire world. But yet we've been involved in nothing but filthy rags. And we know what that is. It's a menstrual cloth. It means you have not received seed. You have not received who you really are. You, you haven't accepted the fact that you are son of God and that God is your source. So everyone could say of themselves what Isaiah confessed of his generation, but also everyone could say, but now, O oh Lord, you are my source. That's where we need to get to. Government's not our source. They, they, you know, they can do bailout after bailout after bailout, but it's not going to help you because you're going to need more. The more that the government gives you, food stamps, whatever it is they give you that you haven't earned, it enslaves you to the government and you become under the control of the government. Same thing as religiosity. We were enslaved to religiosity because we believed that we had to do those things and it was nothing nonstop trying to please God. And again, it produced filthy rags. But again, not everyone is ready to say, but now, because they've not come to the end of their false beliefs. So when our contact and the word Christ is Creo, C-H-R-I-O, it means contact. I know they wrote smearing and rubbing, but it's literally contact. When our contact is secure, our confidence is restored. It's like when Anne is there and they connect those fiber optics to her house and connect the devices to run her television and her internet, she's going to have confidence that she can get on there and she can watch me preach live on Facebook and confidence that she can get on the internet and be able to find out any information she wants. She will have confidence that she can make internet phone calls and it won't keep dropping all the time because she knows there's a source that is powerful and there's a source that's going to keep her in contact. So here's a key word that we need to understand, enmity, E-N-M-I-T-Y. Our confidence is restored and all enmity is overcome through constant contact and meditation. Meditation. Mm -hmm. The English word for enmity comes from the Hebrew word ayab, A-Y-A-B, meaning to hate one of the opposite tribe. Isn't that interesting? What? Meaning to hate one. Now, what did you say before that? The English word enmity comes from the Hebrew word ayab, meaning to hate one of an opposite tribe or party. We could say hate another race. That's really what it means to be, to be hostile, hostile toward another race, nation or country or creed or religion or anything else, any other ism. When you're at enmity with another race, nation or country, then you're at enmity or hate with yourself because you're all one. Can you imagine? I, I, my grandson, little grandson one time was having a fit and he told me that he hated himself. And I said, you can't hate yourself. But now I believe you can. If you hate other people, you hate, your, you hate yourself because you're one. Mm. So I... I have some growing up news for all people. We are not one with our race of color. I'm not one with all white people. Black people are not one with all black people. Chinese people are not one with all Chinese people. Americans are not one with Americans and, and so forth. We're one with God and we're one with one another because our source is God. My source is not my generation that I grew up in. You know, we all look at our DNA and, you know, I thought I was Indian and German and I found out that I'm Irish and British or, or over, over in the Great Britain area. That's my, gener that's my physical generation. But, and, or you could say that's my DNA, but my true DNA is my divine nature and that is God, of God. Can you say it like this, like it's just a piece of the puzzle? But the whole... Well, no, we're just one. There is no, there is no difference. We are one, but we're many members. Yeah. Yes, there's color. Yes, you know, I can be as my, if you look at my legs, I'm as white as I can be. But if I get in the sun, I get brown. 
My sister's been in the sun a whole lot and she's really brown, but she's still me. There's, we, what we have to do is get to this where we see the truth. Now, let me finish this here. It means to hate one of an opposite tribe or party, to be hostile towards another race, nation, or, or creed. And so this, this growing up news that we need to have is we are not separate. We're one. We're not a political persuasion. We've been taught to be a political persu persuasion. We've been taught to be a Republican or a Democrat or a, a socialist or a communist or all that stuff. There's atheists. There, the list goes on and on. But we are one with all people and all people are one with Father. And yes, that's going to get take some time, but it's got to start with you. You know, we always say, well, we're not going to be able to make them. No, it's got to start with you and then teach other people and it multiplies. I found in Luke 23, 12, we found where Pilate and Herod were made friends after they hated each other. They were at enmity with each other, but something happened to make them friends. And Paul wrote an epistle to those at Rome because the carnal inclinations is hostile against the God mind for it resists the prescription of life from God, nor indeed can be. And so Paul, and then Paul wrote to the people at Ephesus that Jesus abolished the religious work of enmity or even the Mosaic law and its ordinances. And then in chapter 2, 6, he said what Jesus said was to slay the hatred and racism that religious cre religion created. So literally religion created that. And by religion, I mean filthy rags, filthy works of righteousness. So once the enmity, the racism, the hate of other races, the division, the diversity in one's consciousness is destroyed, then our contact with Father is permanent. Then we live as son and daughter of God and all our beauty and in perfect harmony with all others. And love reigns, love rules. That's it. That's a simple thing that needs to take place is we need to understand that racism is an enmity to say my race is better than your race. I had an experience the other day. I used to go to a business that the manager was just not very nice. She didn't really care whether she did things with excellence or not. And it really frustrated me somewhat. And I, I ended up complaining about her to the top management. And I said, she's what's running your business down because they ended up having to close that location down. And they wanted to know who she was. I didn't remember her name. I thought she was Indian from, you know, from America to Indian from America. And so I said, I think she's Indian. And so I told them what was going on and they thanked me. Well, I walked into uh, one of the other businesses the other day and lo and behold, she was there. And uh, I immediately felt conviction to go apologize to her. So I did, she checked me out and I asked her if she knew who I was and I forgot I had a mask on so she didn't remember me. But I said, I said I'm the one that was upset because you know I came in a lot, you were printing my books for me. Y'all never, you know, a lot of things happened that upset me and I complained about you and she said, oh, you're the one that called me an Indian. I mean, that was her whole issue that I called her an Indian. And she said, I have you to know that I am black. And it came out like racism, if you would. It came, it was like, that was her source. And I said, ma'am, it matters not what color you are. I'm just telling you, I'm sorry. And it was a very bad problem with her. And that's what racism has done to us today. So, in closing, I want to read Romans chapter 7. It's just, I've got time to do it. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, sometimes people read it and they think he's talking about the condition, still talking about the condition of them at that time. And he was really talking about the condition from chapter 1 to 7. He was talking about the condition of man at the foundation of the world. What caused all this? What caused the death of no knowledge of God to enter into the world? What caused the death of not staying in the contact to enter into the world and everybody received it wrongly? And so he's in chapter seven and he's putting himself in this place when he said my and me, he was just talking about the way it affected man because he had already been made free. 
he had already experienced been made free from all this stuff. He had already been made free from the law when he said, Father, you know, free me from this mindset or this dependency on the law. And Father said, Paul, my grace, my spirit, my, your, your God mind is sufficient. Just draw from your mind. Stay in contact with me and you'll be okay. And so, and I find it disgusting that the translator started out in verse 1 with this false statement. They said, and this is the King James, they said, Know you not, brethren, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. That did not say that. That's because religiosity wanted us to know that we're to stay under the law. And people love the law. They do. I have minister friends that love the law and cry for the law. But the law is the subject of this statement, not man. The law is the subject. And so he was saying, as long as the law lives in our subconsciousness, it has dominion over us. And that's what Paul struggled with before he was freed from it. He, he, when he said there's sin in my members, he was saying the law is still in my members. That's, the, that's what produced the sin. That's what produced the mistaken identity. And that's why he finally said, Father, deliver me from this because it's hindering me. And Father said, stay in contact with me and you'll be okay. And he did from then on. And so he said, as long as the law lives in our subconscious, it has dominion over man. If it dies in our understanding, then it's made void and it's melted away. And you're going to see here that he uses a marriage. And that if, as long as the woman's married to the man, as long as the man lives, then she has to stay married with him. But if not, then, you know, it goes on and on. I'm reading from my translation here, though. I want to read my translation. So Romans 7.1. I write the following to those who tread about in life, being careful to mind the law of the Mosaic system with all its demands and dictates. I call to your attention the fact that the law of Moses, the influences from the mythological and paganistic beliefs and the due to be efforts exercise lordship over those who do so in your conscious awareness and your subconsciousness in as much as they live under those dead systems. An example, according to the Mosaic law, would be if a married woman who ha whose husband is alive is bound to her husband by the law of marriage. However, if her husband dies, the law of marriage for her is rendered entirely idle, useless. Verse 3, and according to the Mosaic law of Moses concerning marriage, if while her husband is still alive, you know, and they divorced, and she enters a sexual union with another man, she will be called an adulterer. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that it is not improper for her if she's joined to another man. This is talking about leaving the law and being joined together or staying in contact with Father. He said, remember, I'm only using marriage under the Mosaic law as an example. I'm not writing concerning the ins and outs of divorce I'm picturing to you how the Mosaic law being dead has no more effect on you. And see, people have, religiosity has taken this King James version and destroyed people that's gotten, been divorced. And we know many people that that's happened. Verse four, you can see how since the husband died, his death freed his wife from being bound to him her entire life. In the same manner also, you can see how the law to which you were previously joined has no more effect on you. We know this because of what Jesus revealed in his incarnational event. He has shown us that the system of the Mosaic law and all its dictates were not from our Father. So now that you know and understand truth of what Jesus revealed, the rules of the Mosaic law are now dead to you. You're no longer bound to the Mosaic law. You're fully aware now that you can tread about in life as holy breath of Father. You are one with Father and with all creation. There is an even greater truth concerning who we eternally are, which Jesus' resurrection revealed. And it is this, from everlasting to everlasting, we should bring forth much spiritual fruit as Father personified in our body, just as Jesus brought forth much spiritual fruit. <clears throat> Verse five, previously we are, we offered those bloody 
dead animal sacrifices, and money because we thought we had to appease our father. We did it because it was all required by the Mosaic law. The hardship and pain of repeatedly offering those things showed forth in us by manufacturing more hate of other, others and adversity, which could be racism, lack and poverty because we did not truly know our father or who we were. The fruit of those dead works produced a sense of perpetual lack, death in our lives. We became dead to living in contact with our father. Verse six, now because of what Jesus revealed to us, we know our father creator never instigated the demanding systems of the law, nor did it have any authority over our lives. Knowing this truth, we can be free. The law is dead. It lies, its lies can no longer hold us down. We thought it was the truth, but it is not. We should now, with even greater passion than we had for Moses' law, volunteer out of our holy breath, out of our entire being, our life source within, to fully enjoin our awareness towards Father and His love and our love for all people. We should no longer view our Father Creator from the skewed, wrongly perceived writings of old. Those views are seen through the murky understanding of the knowledge of good and evil, which brought us an abundance of death. What now? Verse 7. Shall we continue to speak of our, or enforce any command of the Mosaic law? God forbid. The continual offering of the bloody animal sacrifices and giving our possessions to Father, who was mistakenly thought, who we th mistakenly thought needed appeasement, was a catalytic agent for our continual false sense of lack. It calls us to set our consciousness thoughts on a continual lie. It calls us to believe we were in constant need when all along we had everything. If I hadn't sought to obey the law, which said I should not covet, I would not be living with a sense of needing more. I would not have known any sense of lack. Verse eight, the starting point for death, which was produced in my life as a result of seeking the law for righteousness, was when I embraced the sacrificial system that came by the false authority of the Mosaic law. When I started following those hundreds upon hundreds of due to be laws, it formed in me a longing for that which the law outlawed. For where there is no due to be laws, there is no offering of anything to appease our loving Father Creator. That need is dead, and there never was a need to appease Him. From the foundation at one time in the beginning, Man was fully aware of and in contact with Father. Man was treading about in a life with full spirit awareness, enjoying life. No sense of lack ever entered into his mind. At some point, man forgot who he was. An authoritative prescription, which is what the word law means, came from someone who sought knowledge from their own sensual experience, while they were focused upon the knowledge of good and evil. They did not receive it from Father, who is all knowledge and wisdom. They came up with all kinds of do-to-be efforts, including offering a sacrifice of bloody dead animals, fruits and seeds and fowls and gold and silver and other things for the purpose of recovering the life which they thought they lost. They began to make differences in one another. They continued to just, uh, just as we did to live as dead with no awareness of who we were and no knowledge of who our Father Creator eternally is. We thought we were better than other races and nations. Verse 10, I understand why those had the authority prescriptions created such a mosaic law system. They wrongly saw themselves naked. What they lacked was awareness of their holy breath. Father has revealed this to me. This law system was, was their best efforts to recover what they wrongly thought they had lost while they were experiencing a carnally infected awareness. I can testify through my own experience of how their following this prescription for regaining life only brought a perpetual strong sense of separation and death to the knowledge of Father. It ended in all sorts of death. Verse 11, as for myself, Paul the Apostle, when I followed the dictates of the law and its repetitive blood and dead animal sacrifices, that was the starting point for me. It held me in bondage and outright kept me living as dead to the knowledge of our Father. Moses had a pure intention, and his purpose was pure when he devised the commandments of the law. He was dealing with people who were not living out of their spirit. Therefore, Moses took it upon himself to give them guidelines to live by, 
which he thought would appease father. However, when I personally sought to follow the dictates of Moses' law to bring good in my life and to produce holiness, all it did was produce death for me. Following the dictates of the law for righteousness, hoping it might reveal any mark missing or sin in me, as though the law is good to me or good for me, was deadly since all it does is produce more and more dead works. We understand Moses' intended purpose. He wanted the law to be a spiritual thing. However, it existed as a carnal tool to obtain righteousness, and we existed in slavery to the continual bloody sacrifices of dead animals and other dead works, which we thought our father required to be appeased, and we killed other races and tribes. He never needed or required that. So when I try to follow the do-to-be laws, those righteousness acts of the law, which I seek to do, I cannot perform them. Those things which I detest, I do even more because the do-to-be law always fails since they are dead works. I already am who I'm trying to become by those futile efforts of obeying the law. I'm still working. Verse 16, I'm still consciously following the dictates of the law, trying to be right-wise in all my doings. I consent by the actions that I believe doing work is the way to be righteous, but it's not. Now I know that being law-minded, and that word law-minded is a translation of diabolo. It's a devil. It does not originate from my spirit awareness. It comes from sin consciousness. This sin consciousness causes one to continually live in a carnally infected state. It seeks mastership over us. Um, just a few more verses here. Verse 17. Now that I know the truth, I find that it is not the real me. It is not my voice of spirit that tries to accomplish righteousness by obedience to the law. It is that false feeling of not being right with Father. That is the lie that remains in my conscious awareness. I know that any inclination to follow the dictates of the law is the part of me that hinders. It does not produce any good thing. The ability and the will to live as spirit are a power within me, but I sense I was living as carnal by the law. I could not follow through with any good intentions. The source of any good works I did, when done based on efforts to obey the law to be righteous, never produced anything good. It always failed. The rep repetitive, worthless acts I performed to produce righteousness, which I continue to do, remained driven by some strong sense of worthlessness. That was the result of failure to succeed at the due to be laws. It was insanity. If I do things that do not represent my true nature and character, it is not my true self that does them. It is a strong memory of a lifetime of sin consciousness and repetitive worthless acts, which are the dictates of the law that continues to dwell in my consciousness, conscious awareness. This dic this, those dictates of the law are anti or against my holy breath. My holy breath is supply of all that is eternally mine. I have become fully aware that the acts of following the law to do good and the worthless efforts to achieve the things I already possess, which is my right standing with Father, continues to try to prevail me. Now, he's already been freed from this, but he's just putting himself in the place of people living this way. But he said, but now, since the voice of Father has revealed the truth to me, I am well satisfied with the law of the spirit of life. This is the life that was given to us all from Father. The same is the spirit man that I am. So now Paul is putting himself in this place when he uses the word I and you and so forth. I, verse 23, I must pay close attention though, because there continues to be part of the Mosaic law that often hounds me in my conscious awareness. Due to my lifetime habit of seeking to follow it, the great lie of believing I had to do the works of the law to be righteous seeks to resist the law of the spirit of life in my true mind, which is my spirit. If I allow it, the lie I believed for a long time seeks to bring me back into captivity. It makes me feel I must do the law of sacrifices to make me feel better about myself and my side slips. Mm -hmm. Verse 24, I ask this question for all people. How long do we have to bear this horrible weight? of trying to earn our righteousness by doing these many do to be laws. Who shall deliver us from the slavery of that, which produces death to intimacy with Father and to the death of our bodies? 
And finally, in verse 25, the answer is, through the divine inspiration of our Holy Spirit, or our Holy Breath, or Father, and Jesus the great Master, who during this earth walk was the supreme in authority on the subject, revealed it to us in his incarnational events. He let us know that we are right wise with Father, and we always have been, and we must stay in contact with our God mind. We do so by hearing with intelligence the voice of our spirit. I know we were in our eternally, eternally right wise with our Father Creator, which is the non-concealing truth that makes us free from serving the continual sacrifices and the law of sin and death. And I say, Amen. So we put off that old way of teaching and we put on the truth and the awareness of who we are and who all people are. And that will stop all racism, our religiousism, anything that sees us as better than somebody else and we will realize that we are all one. So I hope you enjoyed that, I did. And I think it will bless you. And I believe that we need to accept this for ourselves, and then go forth and spread the good news. And I say it can be the greatest multi-level marketing program there is. If you can teach two people these truths and teach them to teach two people these truths, it can spread out through all the earth and it can bring great deliverance to us. So I love all of you. Uh, if you like that reading on Romans there, I have translated the book of Romans. It's in my uh, webpage, drroyerichmond.com drroyerichmond.com it's called the mystical understanding of the epistle of to the rome romans i think that's how i titled it but it's available and it'll help you a lot so i appreciate you uh, i'm going to be with uh, dr bill henshaw uh, this coming thursday and he's going to interview me and so i hope you guys can join that i'm not going to be doing my own uh, zoom this week so we love you, appreciate you, and if you have any questions or anything, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. God bless you.